Welcome to our No Lies live panel on stolen elections. I'm Jeremy Rothkuschel. I'm going to be your host for today's panel. We have an incredible group of panelists bringing very crucial backgrounds and expertise on this question that we are going to be analyzing today. Could the 2020 elections be stolen via massive voter suppression, computerized vote counting fraud? Will your mail-in vote be counted in 2020? What if Trump loses in 2020 and refuses to leave office? What can we do about it? And what can we do to make sure that our vote and our neighbor's vote and your vote will be counted? So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, I just want to go over our format real quickly before I introduce our panelists. We're going to have each panelist give a 20-minute presentation on their specific uh, subject, and then we're going to have 10 minutes of uh, back and forth amongst the, the panel, uh, including potentially disagreements or furthering of the analysis. And so we'll go through that with each panelist, and then we'll open it up for the last hour for questions from our audience, both in terms of uh, coming into the Zoom forum on uh, video and audio. The instructions are on your linked page on No Lies Radio on how to do that, and then also picking up questions in the Q&A on, uh, on Zoom and bringing those into the fold. So I want to briefly introduce our panelists. I will give them a more uh, further uh, biography as they do right before they do their own presentations. But we have Jonathan Simon, who's going to be speaking on the history of computerized election fraud. Jonathan is the author of Code Red, Computerized Elections and the War on Democracy, now with the updated Election 2020 edition. Uh, he's the executive director of the Election Defense Alliance and has published numerous papers on various aspects of election integrity since 2004. Then we have Jennifer Cohn. She will be uh, working on her article that she recently published on Medium, uh, which is titled Voter Suppression, uh, Tips to Mitigate Threats to Our Votes and Voter Registrations Before November, with her subject for today, Voter Suppression, How to Protect Your Own Vote. Jennifer Cohn is an election integrity advocate, writer, and freelance journalist whose election integrity articles have appeared in the New York Review of Books, who, What, Why, TYT Investigates, The Brad Blog, and Salon. Since the 2016 election, she has focused her professional efforts exclusively on investigating and exposing our country's insecure computerized elections. And then finally, we have former Senator Timothy E. Wirth, who will be focusing on his recently published article in Newsweek titled How Trump Could Lose the Election and Still Remain President. With his specific subject of today of what if Trump loses in 2020, refuses to leave office, and what we can do about it. And Timothy E. Worth is a former congressman and senator from Colorado. Recently, he and a group of similarly concerned citizens have been working to shed light on the potential dangers awaiting us in the 2020 election, as discussed in his Newsweek article. And uh, as I said, my name is Jeremy Rothkuschel. I am a co-producer of the Antidote radio show, which uh, ran for three years weekly on here on No Lies Radio and uh, the much too promised land understanding Israel Palestine on uh, Kansas City KKFI community radio. And I just want to uh, give a brief input about the way that I see this subject framed. In a way, what we have perfectly amongst these panelists is we will be dealing with the background, the history of what we need to pay attention to here in terms of the vast evidence of computerized election fraud that Jonathan Simon will touch upon. Then we have, well, what do we do in this moment, in these coming months before November, where Jennifer Cohn, who also has a deep background on election fraud voter suppression uh, analysis, but we'll be touching directly on what do we need to attend to right at this very moment. And then stepping in with the future, the futuristic dynamics, maybe game theory, and figuring out what we might do 
uh, or what might happen come November into January and what the proper response might be will be uh, Senator Worth. And in many ways, I believe that this subject is at the epicenter of what uh, Thomas Jefferson in his letter from 1787 uh touched on when he said that if he had to choose between a functioning government and a functioning press, he would choose the latter. And of course, what we're up to here is working to use the latter, the functioning press, in this case, really the functioning citizens press, and to inform the people so that we might have the possibility of a functioning government at some point in our American history here. And then finally, this question of the intersection of deep politics and the deep state. The dean of, uh, of uh, deep state analysis, Professor Peter Dale Scott, seemed to lay out that the, the question of the deep state is really about the intersection of the national security apparatus with the underworld of mob economics, of uh, gangsterism, and in many ways, I, I, this is what I proposed when the Trump uh, administration came into power, that what we had seen was a transversal, really, of the deep state, where the gangster mob underworld had risen to the commanding heights of our, of our government in, in many ways. And so these questions only become more and more important in a day and age where almost in a biblical fashion, I would say, we are, our people are starved of knowledge, and we are dealing with the plagues and wars and rumors of wars. And yet here at the table, the question of where we the people and our knowledge of what's going on meets the question of how we decide who is going to represent us in the government. So with that said, I would like to uh, introduce Jonathan Simon to uh, give us his presentation on the history of computer, computerized election fraud. As I said before, Jonathan Simon is the author of Code Red, Computerized Elections and the War on American Democracy, Election 2020 edition, and he updates it uh, you know, consistently, continuing to do the analysis every, every cycle um, of our voting process. He's the Executive Director of Election Defense Alliance and has published numerous papers on various aspects of election integrity since 2004. He's appeared in Stealing America Vote, the American Vote by Vote, and a, Stealing America by Vote, I think it, the title of it is, and Uncounted, The New Math of American Elections, among other documentaries. So you can go see his website at uh, Code Red. Dr. Simon is a graduate of Harvard College and New York University School of Law. All right, Jonathan Simon, please take us away. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jeremy. And uh, a big thanks too to Alan Reese and uh, No Lies Radio uh, for setting this up and for all the participants that, uh, that come see uh, what, we're, what we have to present today. I don't think it's any secret that the election 2020 is in deep trouble uh, and uh, really uncharted territory. Um, and uh, a lot of that is related to uh, COVID and the way that we are um, affected by COVID as voters, as vote counters, uh, verifiers of votes, uh, is really uncharted territory. And so um, we have to look at a couple of separate aspects of, of what's going to uh, go down uh, in the months ahead. And, uh, it's going to include the casting of votes, the counting of votes, the verifying of votes, and what happens in the post-election uh, period. And um, a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today it will have to do with that post-election period, will have to do with the casting of votes. Um, and a lot of the alarm in the media uh, that's going around now has to do with that post-election period. What if Trump loses and won't doesn't want to leave office um, and uh, other scenarios that uh, Senator Worth will be getting to um, and the impediments to casting votes, uh, the, the polling places that are, that are closed, uh, the clampdown uh, mostly by the uh, GOP on mail-in voting, uh, making it more difficult to cast a vote. But what I'm going to um, talk about and uh, present a little bit about 
is really the backstory to all this, how we got here, the elections of the computerized voting era, um, because we also have to deal with the counting of the votes and uh, the fact that that is still concealed, it's computerized and it's, it's just it, uh, almost uh, laughably vulnerable to uh, manipulation. And so this will be uh, sort of a story of how that uh, vulnerability has played out over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, I really could take about three or four hours in presenting it. I'll try to get it in and in 20 minutes, we'll be just sort of hitting the high notes of that history because it'll tell us a lot about what we're, what we're in for um, coming up in November and following. So it begins with the hanging chads. That's the late Judge Rosenberg uh, down in Palm Beach, I believe trying to uh, figure out uh, who, what the votes were in the 2000 election between uh, Gore and Bush. And of course, that was an iconic photo. It, it made a mockery of the recounts. It made a mockery of the whole uh, counting process. And um, it, it, uh, it was used, it was pivoted on uh, to modernize uh, our, our vote counting. Um, but in, in, in that same 2000 election, we saw this. We saw these, uh, these staffers sent down from Washington, uh, mostly by Trent Lott, uh, uh, who was one of the congressional leaders at the time, but also Roger Stone had a lot to do with this and other uh, familiar figures uh, from today's world uh, were part of this Brooks Brothers riot. Uh, designed to intimidate the counters in the Florida recount in Miami-Dade, stop them from counting. Um, and it led to uh, a lot of, of course, there was a, a litigation process that led to the Supreme Court and Bush v. Gore. And there I was at Bush v. Gore. Um, and Bush v. Gore, you know, it's kind of ancient history, but Really, it, uh, it, the Supreme Court imposed itself, came up with a pretty novel jurisprudence um, and to stop the counting, stop the recount and hand the election to Bush. Uh, but what was important about 2016, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, two, the 2000 election was this, that it really was the first glimmer that we had that politics was gonna be fought completely differently uh, that there wasn't going to be this comedy, there wasn't going to be this mutual respect. Uh, and in place, there were going to be tactics like this. And this should look pretty familiar because we're seeing more and more and more of it. Uh, this was a very overt tactic. Um, but what we unfortunately uh, have seen in the past 20 years are some very covert tactics, uh, all designed to just win. Uh, doesn't matter how, doesn't matter how you get there, uh, just make it happen, just win. And that's what has really bedeviled our elections. Um, uh, elections have always been rough and tumble, uh, but the lengths that have, have been gone to have been really extraordinary. And now we're going to just sort of look at that. Um, so that hanging Chad's debacle and the problem in the 2000 election led to the passage of the Help America Vote Act. Uh, in 2002, and you can see that uh, it changed uh, the nature, the way votes were counted, lever machines disappeared, punch cards disappeared, hand counted disappeared, basically all taken over by uh, touch screens uh, with no paper trail, some touch screens with a paper trail, and a lot of optical scanners, uh, which are computers um, to scan ballots uh, that are, that are uh, marked by voters. Um, and so technically there is a, a record left of the ballot, um, but uh, we see that in practice that record is almost never accessed and never accessible. And so when HAVA was being challenged in court a few years later, uh, we can see some of the uh, signers of an amicus brief defending HAVA. Uh, and we'll see some pretty familiar names there. First of all, they're virtually all Republicans. We see Tom Feeney, uh, who was the Speaker of the Florida House at one time, became a Congress uh, congressman. We see Louis Gohmert of, of recent uh, note. Uh, we see Daryl Issa, uh, Jim Jordan, Steve King, uh, Mike Pence, Paul Ryan. In other words, a, a real who's who of, of the right wing 
Kevin McCarthy. Uh, and these were the defenders of Hava. The Republicans wanted computerized vote counting. Uh, and uh, they still want computerized vote counting. And they are always um, in support of things like uh, barcode ballot marking devices. Uh, the less transparency, the better. Uh, and, it, and we can trace it all the way back to the Help America Vote Act, a brainchild of uh, Mitch McConnell, Bob Ney, uh, Roy Blunt. Uh, it's striking that a bill that was uh, to computerize elections, which uh, had the one impact was to increase uh, turnout, should have been promoted uh, by those whose goal for the last uh, at least half century has been to decrease turnout. So the question was, what was in it for them that uh, overcame the fact that the disadvantage to the Republicans uh, of the increased turnout that we would get from this kind of voting? And that question has never really been answered. But um, in 2002, uh, first election under Hava, the exit polls were spiked completely. They were so far off, all in the same direction, that the network spiked them. Uh, they were never released publicly. So that was kind of a red flag. And it got us, some of us anyway, uh, really attentive. And so when the 2004 bush Kerry election came along, um, I was the fellow who sat up and printed out here 354 pages of unadjusted exit polls. What are unadjusted exit polls? There are exit polls that have not yet been um, reweighted to make them conform with the vote counts. So they represent an independent measure, uh, a baseline, an independent baseline of the intent of the electorate. Um, on that particular night, it's a long story all of its own, but the exit polls were, the unadjusted exit polls were left up uh, longer than uh, they generally are. They were left up for hours. It enabled me, I didn't have PDF at the time, it enabled me to print them all out. And the question was, what, you know, what did this mean? Uh, we saw numbers coming out, and I don't expect anybody to read all these numbers, but it just gives you an example of how we sort of spreadsheeted it. We looked at the pattern. And we saw a very, very damning pattern in 2004. And what that pattern was, was that concentrated in the key states, the swing states of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Colorado, there were these large red shifts, um, which meant that the exit polls favored Kerry, the vote counts shifted and favored Bush. Um, and in many cases, by an amount enough to reverse the outcome of the election. So if the exit polls had been correct and the vote counts uh, wrong, then Kerry would have won that election apart from all the specific shenanigans in Ohio. But what we also found was that this pattern, this tendency uh, of, of shift was concentrated where it mattered. In other words, we didn't see nearly as much of it in the safe states uh, that didn't matter from an electoral college standpoint. So we saw a pattern, and we'll see this pattern again, uh, what I call a second order comparative. So we're not just looking at exit poll versus vote count. We're looking at these exit polls versus these vote counts and those exit polls versus those vote counts. And it's a more sophisticated way of using uh, the exit poll information or tracking poll information, uh, any kind of independent baseline. Uh, when we can set it up this way and we see different things happening in competitive races from non-competitive races, that becomes very strong and very probative. So what we saw led to a graph uh, with a very, very small possibility that Bush had actually, uh, I'm looking for my pointer here, yeah, a very small probability that Bush had won um, if, if the exit polls were valid. And I will say this about exit polls, they come in for a lot of criticism, often discredited, uh, definitely a punching bag for the media and certainly for the right wing. Um, but the reality is that the methodology uh, and the inner workings of exit polls happen to be a lot more transparent 
uh, than the workings of the computerized vote counts. If you just think about that for a second, what we're relying on and considering as gospel, the computerized vote counts are far more opaque uh, than the exit polls. These votes are counted in the pitch dark of cyberspace by partisan outfits. And we see these, uh, these disparities and these anomalies and these shifts, and they're always going basically always in the same direction. Uh, so sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, uh, but when you have a whole box of cigars and they're all pointing in the same direction after they've been shaken up and tossed around and thrown on the ground and they all come out pointing in the same direction, that's a whole nother story from uh, an evidentiary or a forensics standpoint. So there I was presenting at the National Press Club, the, the graph that you just saw, there was a lot of hubbub at that time. Uh, we actually demonstrated Steve Freeman in a book uh, called Was the 2004 Pres uh, Presidential Election Stolen? Uh, really, really went deep, deep dive into the data. We had much more data available then than we do now. Uh, again, a complex issue, uh, but that was the reality. And we basically proved that the election was stolen. I mean, you can read the book and anybody who reads the book or reads my papers or those of my colleagues at the time, um, they were really never rebutted. And uh, the evidence was extremely strong that there was vote count manipulation. Um, so we then went on and looked at the 2006 election. Um, and this is, again, not meant to, to really study in detail. What we were able to do in 2006 is to show that the exit polls, which demonstrated a much, much greater landslide for the Democrats in the House of Representatives and also the Senate, but we were focusing here mostly on the House, um, that, that those exit polls were valid because the demographics of those exit polls, how many Democrats, how many Republicans, how many older people, younger people, voters of color, white voters, um, rich, poor, they mirrored uh, the all the other data that was available from the census and from other independent longitudinal studies. They were either, they either duplicated it or they were actually to the right of it. So we had an exit poll sample that was actually to the right of the electorate and it showed a much greater democratic victory. So again, we had some very strong evidence. We had a validated baseline. Um, we did something else as well. We, we looked at, uh, we used the same, we ran our own polls and we used the same set of respondents um, and we looked at correlations. And what we found is that the closer the race was, the more competitive a race was, and that's what this regression line is showing, the more likely it was to be red shifted in polls that used the same set of respondents and asked them about a competitive race and a non-competitive race that they had just voted in. And the competitive races showed the red shift. And so that, again, because we were using the same set of respondents, we didn't have to worry about selection bias, of those respondents, we didn't have to worry about response bias. It basically took those factors out of play and we came out with a very strong statistical significance. You can see the p-value up there is a very powerful one. Um, so that was 2006 and we showed, um, again, that there was this same uh, tendency. We, we found it as well in 2008, even though Obama was elected um, in a lot of the down ballot races, Senate races, some of the state races. Um, then we came to, to 2010 and we found in Massachusetts a special election uh, with a, an enormous redshift um, in favor of the Republican candidate, uh, Scott Brown, um, between votes that were counted by hand and votes that were counted by machine, the OPSCAN votes. Um, and what we did is we went and we looked at these jurisdictions. So we didn't just say, oh, okay, well, the hand count votes were, were more in favor of the Democrat and the OPSCAN votes were more in favor of the Republicans. Aha, we've got you. No, we looked at those, those jurisdictions. We looked at their politics. We looked at their re voter registrations. We looked at how they had voted in previous elections, in non-competitive elections. And we validated the fact that what we called Opscanville was actually more democratic 
than Hancountville, uh, Opstan Shire and Hancountville what we, was what we called them, uh, because these were aggregate groups of jurisdictions throughout the state. And so again, we validated our baseline. This is a very, very important step. Um, and because I'm racing through this, it's, it's, it's really hard to um, do justice to all of this, but this is all in the book Code Red um, uh, that Jeremy mentioned uh, that is out in a new edition. Uh, you can find it all in considerable uh, greater detail there. Uh, but this was just how we approach uh, election forensics. We approach it meticulously uh, and conscientiously and nonpartisanly. I mean, we, we I may have partisan views about how this country should go, uh, but when we're analyzing this data, we use the numbers uh, and we use analysis that can be replicated by anyone of any persuasion. Um, so this was just more of the validation of the baseline. In 2014, so I'm skipping ahead, there's a lot being skipped here, but in 2014, the Congress, which was a Republican majority at the time, had an approval rating of 8%. And this is uh, according to Rasmussen, who is uh, not exactly a, a flaming left-wing pollster. They, they veer very strongly to the right. So the majority Republican Congress had an 8% approval rating. In that election, 222 Republican incumbents of the House stood for re-election and with an 8% approval rating, and if you by contrast, look at Obama's approval rating was 47%. Um, and, and for the first time in polling history, voters didn't even think their own representative deserved re-election. Uh, we had never seen that before. Usually they hate Congress, but they love their own representative. This was an absolute throw the bums out of election. People were fed up, they'd had enough. Uh, of all the obstructionism, 8% approval for Congress, single digit. Of the 222 Republicans who stood for re-election in the House, 220 succeeded and were re-elected. There's a re-election rate of 99.1% on an approval rating of 8%. This is not how a democracy is supposed to work. Uh, and it really raises and begs the question of what's going on. Who's making these choices? Is it the people, the voters? Is it the programmers of the machines? What is going on to, to lead to results like this? Um, going backwards, I wanna go forwards. In that same 2014 election, the conclusion was that, well, the Democrats just didn't turn out. Uh, so that must have been what happened. There's always a, a kind of a quick, quick take media story that explains everything uh, in an organic way or a benign way with no mention of the counting process. As vulnerable as, as it is, uh, when, uh, you know, the results come in, it's like, well, you know, this is, this is, this is what happened. The Democrats just didn't come out to vote. Well, that same election, here are all these liberal or progressive ballot measures in some states, not, in, not all red states either, um, Arkansas, Alaska, Florida, and they're all passing by rig-proof margins, by, by huge margins of victory, not likely to be rigged. Um, but who is voting for this, if not those progressive voters who just didn't elect Democrats? The Republicans actually gained 13 seats in a, in a throw the bums out election in which they came in with a majority, they gained 13 House seats and an enormous number of state legislative seats as well during the entire Obama presidency. It was absolute carnage. The Democrats lost a net of almost a thousand state legislative seats and one state house after another, Republicans basically took over the country. Yes, there were some non-suspect factors going on there. There was voter suppression going on. There were other uh, factors, the way the money was spent, et cetera, et cetera, but nowhere near enough to explain that. And here were some right-wing ballot measures, uh, anti-abortion, pro-gun, et cetera, all failed by big margins. Uh, but yet the Republicans 
return 99% of their incumbents with an 8% approval rating and increase their margin in the House. So that brought us to 2016. And what I want to say about 2016 uh, is that at that point, the voters had every right to be disgusted. Um, and uh, when Bernie Sanders went down, uh, we wound up with an election between Clinton and Trump. Uh, they had the lowest approval ratings uh, of, of any two presidential candidates since polling had started. Uh, nobody was enthusiastic. Um, that having been said, we got uh, a lot of advance notice that, that Clinton was going to win this thing. Everybody was assuming that. Uh, went in uh, with leads in all these key states. Uh, Nate Silver, aggregate pollster, uh, gave her 600 to 1 odds. Um, this election obviously was a shocker. And it has led directly to where we are now. In that election, the exit polls played a very important role in our forensics. Um, what we saw there, and I want to try to be as clear about this as I, as I possibly can, um, was there was a sample taken of the nation as a whole. And that included competitive states, non-competitive states, um, whole nine yards. And uh, that sample, there was a little red shift, but basically it was within the range, uh, expected range of margin of error. Uh, it was basically accurate. In spite of the fact that apparently it had too many college educated voters in the sample and all that, no matter what, slice it and dice it, it came out right. But in the states that mattered, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Florida, Ohio, which is not listed here, um, we saw not only huge red shifts given the sample size, these were way outside the margin of error, um, but red shifts that reversed the results. In all of these four states, reversed the results. If, if these exit polls, as the national exit polls seem to be, and these were taken by the same firm on the same day using the same methodology. If they were correct, then Clinton won this election going away, not just the popular vote, but the Electoral College by a near landslide. Um, there's some complexities involving the exit polls in Florida and Michigan because those are two time zone states and therefore the unadjusted exit polls are not really unadjusted. They, they have an hour to adjust them before posting them. Uh, these, these details, again, you know, they're covered uh, in the book and in various articles. But this is the big picture. That was the big picture. Um, very, very damning evidence. And yet, the national press basically said, well, the exit polls are off again. Can't trust those exit polls. Too many college-educated voters. They weren't looking at this. Why? Where the elections were not competitive, where the, the majority of the vote was taken from elections that were not worth rigging, that made no sense in shifting votes. You got this, you got accurate, and where it really counted, these Clinton firewall states, you got this. You got way off all in the same direction. And for what it's worth, we saw a, a parallel in the Senate races as well. Um, Let's see what I've got. I am over my time substantially. So I just made it up to 2016, but the story continued in 2017, in 2018, uh, and right up to the present time. And so um, I, I guess what I, what I want to leave the discussion with for the time being is that there are a tremendous number of things to worry about um, coming up. It's, it's, there's, 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 vote casting, there's vote counting, there's a lot of confusion. It's the perfect storm. The Democrats track record in the past when you've had situations like this has not been good, whether it was 2000, 2004, other elections, uh, they have really shown themselves to be tactically inept uh, or strategically inept. Um, so that's, that's another factor involved, which is you know, Team Biden, Team Trump, Team Republican, Team Democrat, there are some significant uh, skill disparities here. Uh, recent uh, gaming, and I think Senator Worth 
will will really hit on this, so I don't want to steal his thunder, but preventing a disrupted presidential election and transition is, of course, another thing to worry about. But before we worry about Trump not leaving office if he loses, we have to worry about Trump and the GOP and Karl Rove, who is on the team now, uh, which should raise some significant concerns in and of itself, um, and not to mention foreign uh, interference. We have to worry about uh, actually Trump losing first. And so we have to look at a very difficult um, dilemma coming up, which is that all what I've presented here and the more detailed uh, version of it really does undercut the legitimacy of our elections. And yet we're going into an election where Trump's best play is to undercut the legitimacy of the election. So there's a bit of heads I win, tails you lose about the months that are, that are coming up. And we're gonna have to really thread that needle and be very, very careful um, how this is dealt with and uh, you know how we collect data, how we analyze data um, and how we present that data. And of course the media will have a big, big say in all of that um, along the way. A lot of this, and Jenny will pick up on this, is going to fall on the individual voters' shoulders uh, to make sure your vote gets, um, if not counted, at least received, um, to make sure that you can successfully cast your ballot. Um, this is a major challenge. We really have to up our game as individuals uh, in, in, in successfully casting a vote. Um, this is code red. The book, I think it'll help people in that endeavor. Um, so I hope it, 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 we can spread the word on that. Uh, this is my contact uh, information um, for anybody who is, uh, you know, wants to contact me and talk about this uh, further or, or or help in some way. Um, there it is, and uh, we can probably keep that archived someplace for you. So again, I'm sorry, running over. As I said, there was about four hours there, and I managed to get it into 27 minutes. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to take, you know, uh, let's discuss um, anything that we, we uh, find confusing or want to add, I'd be happy to uh, participate in that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan Simon, for that very, very uh, elucidating presentation there. And um, if if our fellow panelists, uh, Senator Worth and Jennifer Cohn, would like to weigh uh, in on that, we're open to that right now. Ooh. Jennifer, I please. would like to. Jennifer, please go. Hi, Jonathan. That was incredible. It's been so long since I read your book, Code Red, and now I, uh, yeah, I'm pretty much motivated to go read it again because what I loved about it was you just didn't just say, "Look at the exit polls." You scientifically went through and eliminated so many of the benign explanations for that redshift and just did it in, in really excruciating but very persuasive detail. And it's just uh, really remarkable work. I am curious, I know I raised this issue with you before and I can't remember where we left it, but to your knowledge, have, have exit polls ever been used or admitted into evidence during an, as part of an election challenge in court? Short answer to my knowledge, no. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure why I think there is a general assumption that it's not what we would call best evidence. The problem is that the best evidence, which would be memory cards, code used to program them, voter mark ballots are proprietary and almost always off limits, uh, virtually always off limits and unavailable. Um, so we're generally working uh, as from a forensic standpoint with indirect evidence. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately that has not made its way uh, into the litigation. It's really been, it's made its way into the court of public opinion and it's come under scathing attack there. Um, yeah. One can imagine what attorneys would, would do to it, but that does not, uh, if you, and again, I mean, part of this is that real care has to be taken in looking into such things. Uh, unfortunately, a lick and a promise won't do it. And a quick look and a quick dismissal, uh, just it doesn't really do justice to the work that is done um, forensically and statistically 
um, in looking at these patterns. And, and I have to say patterns that, you know, if you were doing epidemiology or agronomy or astronomy, uh, this kind of analysis would be relied upon routinely. Uh, it's very, very powerful uh, work. It has its flaws and it also has its proponents who are less conscientious and unfortunately yes. that drags that drags us all down. Um, but I have to say that we, you know, we, we really do try uh, to, was, to be conscientious. Yeah, I was hoping you could touch on that a little, on some of the more simplistic analyses that I've seen circulating around and that you and I have seen circulating around. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, one good example uh, would be the, the 2020 primaries uh, where you had, um, Biden and Bernie Sanders, basically, uh, but a number of candidates. And the exit polls were off and they seemed to favor Biden. Uh, the problem was that these, these primaries were extremely difficult to exit poll. The way we were voting was changing. The field of candidates were cha was changing. People were withdrawing. They were making endorsements, Klobuchar, Buttigieg. Um, there was tremendous amount of flux and very, very difficult to get a handle on who the electorate actually was going to be. And there were a lot of organic explanations uh, for why Biden came through the way he did. And I don't say this as a partisan for Biden, um, just as an, as an observer of the process. And yet you had people going out and screaming fraud from the rooftops based on exit polls that really had no baseline. They had no validation. They were methodologically uh, very different and quite a bit weaker from those we were looking at in the past and in the 2016. So it's that kind of thing. Um, it makes it easy for the critics and the debunkers to basically say, see, this is, this is basically crap. And uh, the, one really has to work at it a little bit uh, to, you know, comprehend and fully understand what's being presented and what is probative and what is not. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, Jeremy's muted. Yes. yes. Okay. Do you, you want to uh, raise something, Senator Worth? Yeah, I was going to, uh, Jonathan, that was fascinating. I would say we were, we were with uh, John Kerry on the night of uh, 2004 and thought at the end of the evening, you know, right close to right before midnight that uh, he was going to be the next president. <laughs> and, and we certainly were wrong. So what happens? I'm, I'm a little, I, your, your analysis was fascinating, but so what does it what does it mean for what we do? Tell tell us what do we do about this, or what is there an antidote, or is there a what, what's the what's the therefore of of your fascinating presentation? Oh, I thought we were screening out the what can we do about it questions. Uh, <laughs> that is that is the sixty four thousand dollar question, and unfortunately, it's very late in the game right now. I mean, we've let this. I mean, if you picture, you know, you have a you have a, 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 a cancer, some sort of uh, lymphoma, let's say, and you let it sit around and sit around and sit around and finally it goes aggressive and it can be too late. Um, we've sat on this since really since 2000, certainly since Hava 2002, uh, when reforms might have been uh, undertaken both at the federal level and at the state level. Um, so now we're in a position where we're going to count the votes the way we count them. I mean, we're not going to pass legislation in the next three months to change the way the votes counted. They're not going to change the, uh, the corporate actors that are involved in this process. We're not even going to sew up uh, the holes, the vulnerabilities. I could do a whole nother presentation on just how you would uh, in, rig those races and how you would change uh, the programming in the computers. And, and the scary part of it is it's very simple. It's something a high schooler could do. Uh, we've seen that with DEF CON a little bit. You've seen 11 year olds hack into these machines. Uh, problem is we're vulnerable, not just to outside hackers. And this, this is one of the, the really truly mind numbing, you know, you forehead slapping um, uh, fact, uh, aspects of this over the last 20 years uh, is this idea that uh, the system might be vulnerable to hackers, but that's all we have to worry about. Obviously, it's vulnerable to anybody on the inside who could be suborned to program these machines uh, in a malicious way to begin with. Uh, and that's really the prime vector. Uh, and we won't even, even now, we won't look at that. 
Um, so we're, we're in a tough position. I mean, I can't sugarcoat it. Uh, we are in a position where we do really have to be as vigilant as possible. We have to, and Jen, I think we'll talk about this. I mean, we have to photograph poll tapes. Uh, we have to be on, we have to be present and watching to see if there are patches that are put into these machines. We have to see if there are breakdowns in the counting process. We have to load, um, upload, download, I can never remember. Um, not a computer guy, <laughs> but uh, you know, running totals of votes to look for anomaly patterns. We're gonna pull uh, exit polls if there are any. Uh, we're gonna look at um, tracking polls and spreadsheet all that out. We're gonna look at a thing called cumulative vote share analysis. We're gonna try to get whatever handle we can to get as accurate a picture as we can to what's has gone down. The problem is this is a process and a system that was designed for concealment, the vote counting process. It's not transparent. In other countries, they've recognized the error of that way. The Netherlands, Ireland, Norway, New Zealand, um, Germany. These are countries that went away from the machines and started counting their elections publicly, observably, by hand, by humans, where the process could be watched by members of both sides and any independent observers. Uh, that's really what guarantees you uh, a, a, a fraud-free election. Uh, we're not, we haven't gone there. And so we're looking at a very, very corruptible system. Uh, and we just have to do what we can as individual voters. I mean, going into this year, uh, I was working on something called a We Count Now initiative. We was trying to recruit individuals, I, I was hoping by the millions, certainly by the hundreds of thousands, to basically sign up to count votes uh, and to present this to their uh, um, uh, election administrators at the local level, at the county level, state level, uh, and say, here we are. Don't, don't say you can never find the staff. There are a thousand of us right here. We're ready to count this election. Unfortunately, COVID intervened uh, in the mandates of social distancing, uh, made that project uh, much more problematic. It really uh, is, is kind of in, in suspension for now. Uh, but those are the kind of things that we really have to do uh, because it's very difficult legislatively to make these reforms. I mean, you can see the you know basic security um, allocations are bottled up by Mitch McConnell and the Republicans at the federal level, and many cases at the state levels as well. So, you know, getting an easy legislative fix to this is it's it's probably tougher than climate change, and um, so that means it falls back to the people uh, really stepping up and and assuming a greater role and a role that previously was not really uh, contemplated in our democracy and in the functioning of the electoral process. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and thank you all. And as we move now to uh, Jennifer Cohn's presentation um, there, uh, I do have a question and there's another question from the audience, but we'll put it off uh, for towards the end. But for the time being, there is a question in the chat that just maybe we should put on the table as uh, a larger awareness from Edward Averill with the idea, could transparency be legally defined and applied so that computer voting that doesn't support transparency would not count, such as shared ballot images would re-enable uh, volunteer support without COVID problems? And um, and so we will uh, uh, come back to other questions uh, towards the end here. But um, up next, we would like to hear from Jennifer Cohn on voter suppression, how to protect your own vote. Um, and you can go see her Medium article, Tips to Mitigate Threats to Our Votes and Voter Registrations Before November. Jennifer Cohn is an election integrity advocate, writer, and freelance journalist whose election integrity articles have appeared in the New York Review of Books, amongst many other places. Since the 2016 election, she has focused her professional efforts exclusively on investigating and exposing our country's insecure computerized elections. Jennifer graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles, West Side, in 1989, and Hastings College of Law in 1993. She was a law partner at Nielsen, Haley, and Abbott in Marin County for many years, where she specialized in insurance coverage and civil appeals. Before that, she specialized in criminal appellate law. Thank you very much, Jennifer Cohn. We're looking forward to your presentation.
Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. So I'm going to go through a list of about uh, 20 different things that individual voters can do to protect our votes before November and in November. But first, um, I want to just do a very short synopsis of what I see as the greatest concerns and greatest risks, or at least some of them going into the 2020 election and speaking from an electronic voter suppression angle, um, primarily. So number one, we've been talking about transparency and that when I started doing this work, that's what really one of the early things that really stuck out for me is that Americans don't think of our elections in terms of transparency and other countries do. And so, for example, in I believe it was 2009, the German Germany's highest court came down with a ruling that effectively outlawed at least touchscreen voting machines on the notion that they were not sufficiently transparent and they defined it to mean in effect that the average voter should be able to observe and understand the processes that are used to count their votes and touch screens obviously prevent them from doing that but we do sort of the opposite thing in the united states we don't even talk about transparency so instead we rely on machines which are obviously inherently opaque they are literally an electronic um, black box. There's nothing magical really in some ways about hand marked paper ballots, except that the marking of them is transparent. But if you go and count them behind closed doors, that's not transparent either. But it's sort of by definition, you're counting them behind closed doors when you use a machine. And also on the same sub subject of a lack of transparency, we as a country have been misled by people in positions of trust as to the nature of the risks that arise from our use of electronic voting equipment. In particular, after the 2016 election, people we trusted told us that our system was too decentralized to allow an outcome altering attack. And this was by the Obama administration actually put this out. Um, and Jay Johnson has since said that that was really not true. And that they knew that that was really not true because we obviously have swing states and we have the electoral college and it wouldn't really take very many votes to swing a national election and not only that we he didn't say this but the, the truth is we have just two mega vendors private vendors that account for more than 80 percent of u.s election equipment and those vendors are esns and dominion voting and so if you have just two vendors both of whom have sort of shady and especially with esns not a very good history with um, election security, you know, with data breaches and protecting information, it's really, if either of those vendors were, be, were to be infiltrated by corrupt insiders or by internet hackers, they could wreak havoc on elections throughout the US. The other thing that we were told is after 2016 is that it would be really um, difficult for internet hackers, such as Russian actors, to alter the outcome of an election because voting machines supposedly never connect to the internet. And that was a lie, or at best it was misleading. So um, as it turns out, in Wisconsin, the precinct ballot scanners, and in Florida, the precinct ballot scanners, and, in, um, and now more recently in Michigan, the precinct ballot scanners, all include wireless modems that actually send vote totals over the internet. So those machines are connecting to the internet and then the machines on the receiving end of those of those transmissions, the central county computers have to connect to the internet also in order to receive those vote totals. So that was um, just not true. Not only that, even if particular voting machines don't themselves connect to the internet, not all, not all of them do, they all receive programming from centralized county or state computers that experts say in many and perhaps most instances are able and often do connect to the internet or receive input from other and updates from other systems that are internet connected. So the, the notion that internet hackers could not alter vote tallies in any significant way is was just a fallacy. Um, we also were misled as it turns out about Russia's ability to change actual vote tallies. And we had been led to believe that the, the only problem was voter registration systems, which is a significant problem, by the way. You can absolutely change an election outcome by purging people from the voter rolls. But we were led to believe it didn't have it really much to do with vote tallies. That was not really in play. And the book Rigged by David Scheimer, which I recommend and recently read, um, it included 
quotes and um, paraphrasing from four senior members of the Obama administration who said that actually Russian actors absolutely were in a position to change vote tallies in 2016, and that this was very much on the administration's mind, and that this is what Obama was talking about when he got in Putin's face and said, you know, don't mess with the 2016 election. He was talking about vote tallies. So, um, that speaks to the lack of transparency. And the reason why it matters what happened in 2016 is we're facing another election where we're being told now, especially Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut, um, who has access to classified briefings, has in the last several days been posting frantically on Twitter, pretty much just jumping up and down, saying that whatever happened in 2016 is child's play compared to what they are being told that Russia can do in 2020 and that the people deserve to know. So here's just a quick quote of one, from one of his tweets. Shocked and appalled, I just left a 90 minute classified briefing on foreign malign threats to our elections. From spying to sabotage, Americans need to see and hear these reports. Protect our democracy from destruction by declassifying de key intel describing the danger of foreign subterfuge to our elections. Congress has been briefed, but sworn to secrecy unacceptably. So essentially, he's in the position that reality winner, the um, the Air Force veteran who leaked the classified um, NSA report after the 2016 election. He's in that position where the public is in the dark. He has access to classified information that the public deserves and needs to know. And um, you know whether someone will be as heroic as reality winner and release this to the public remains to be seen. But they locked her up for five years, and I think that part of the reason they did that was for this very reason, was to, um, in case anyone else thought about releasing similarly incriminating um, information about our elections in the future, that they wouldn't want to go to prison like she has been sent to prison. The, lar the longest sentence ever under the Espionage Act is what they handed down for her. It was five years, and whereas Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen have been released on compassionate release due to COVID-19. She was not, her request was denied and delayed and she actually has COVID-19 now. So she contracted it. Um, I'm concerned about voter registration systems. Those by definition connect to the internet. We know that Russia breached at least two, maybe more in 2016. The FBI won't let Florida election officials tell the public which ones those were. Um, I'm worried about mail voting. I'm worried about Louis DeJoy, who is the Trump, um, he's a mega donor to Trump, who's now our postmaster general, and he is running around shutting down post offices and firing executives. Um, so even in the past, even before the pandemic, and even before this Louis DeJoy was made the postmaster, we had problems with hundreds of thousands and likely millions of voters not receiving mail ballots on time to cast them, and with many, many tens of thousands of voters um, having their ballots tossed away before they were even cast due to failure to sign the ballot and not following other instructions. I'm worried that the Trump administration will make signature match the new hanging chads in 2020. So the Democrats are out, you know, rah, rah, vote by mail, and then it will be turned against them. Um, with in-person voting, that is, had been my main focus before the pandemic, but I'm very concerned because we do have these internet connected ballot scanners in swing states. The DS, ESNS's DS200 ballot, precinct ballot scanners have wireless modems in Wisconsin, Florida, Michigan, and Illinois, and perhaps elsewhere. And electronic poll books are these tablet check-in computers that have taken off like wildfire since 2016. Uh, we had them in the past, but they have, at, as of 2018, they were up 50%. They were already in a quarter of the states. I imagine two years later, it's much higher, and they connect to the internet, and they are using them to program activation cards for new touchscreen voting machines that in and of themselves have already been considered very unreliable and insecure. And, and experts have said that we should be using hand-marked paper ballots for most voters, not these touchscreens. But they're also activating these new touchscreens with electronic poll books that connect to the internet. Um, and then the absence of robust manual audits. There were efforts to get legislation that would have required robust manual audits for um, all of our federal elections and the GOP killed them all. They killed all of them. And so that, you know, what can we do? That would have been something to do, but, but that didn't happen. That is not to say I am, as an attorney, I'm someone who doesn't like to say we've got all of these terrible problems and we can't do anything about them. So I wrote an article recently and um, I'm going to talk about it. 
So tips to mitigate threats to our votes and voter registrations before November. Um, the first thing I would say is if you are going to vote by mail, you want to request your mail ballot as soon as possible because of all these threats and delays that the mail service is experiencing and even experienced, frankly, before the pandemic, it will be much worse now. You want to request, if you want to vote by mail, you want to request your mail ballot as soon as possible. And I strongly recommend also returning it as soon as possible. That wasn't typically one of my recommendations because I don't love the idea of mail ballots sitting around unattended for weeks on end. But I'm hearing more and more that Trump may try to um, call the election early and that the longer that we drag it out with counting vote by mail, that that he'll, he just will find a way to try to not count those later ballots. So I would say return it as soon as you can. And I recommend using, calling your county, finding out if there is an in-person drop-off option in your county. And if there is one, use it. Um, drop boxes, for example, or t returning it to an election office. Next, if you decide to vote in person instead, or if you have to vote in person because you didn't receive your mail ballot, um, I recommend strongly, well, you have to bring your, your ID. So call your county and make sure, or check your county election website and make sure you know what type of ID to bring. And here's a tip that you don't hear much, but you really should, we should all be talking about this, is to bring your completed sample ballot with you. And you can typically get a, your completed sample ballot from your um, county election website or state election website. You can also call them if you don't see it there. Most jurisdictions, I believe, have these. You want to fill it out, complete it, and bring it with you. And no matter what type of voting system you use on election day, whether it's hand-marked paper ballots or a touch screen, it will speed up the voting process and significantly help reducing lines. Again, if you're voting in person, I strongly recommend that you ask to vote with a ballpoint pen, which is a hand-marked paper ballot, rather than using a touchscreen voting machine that generates a paper printout that election officials also call a paper ballot. So the word hand is really important. The word ballpoint pen is really important to make these distinctions. And I, I recommend that you do this. Experts say that they are more secure and more reliable than touchscreens. Um, a recent study also showed they take a third of the time to use. So they would actually make lines much shorter than these new touch screen, they call them ballot marking devices, these new touch screen voting systems that are called um, ballot marking devices and have also taken off like wildfire, wildfire since 2016. Um, many of these touch screen machines that I recommend at least attempting to avoid put voter selections into barcodes and humans can't read barcodes. So there you go. Is this Joe Biden or is this Donald Trump? Obviously, you can't tell which it is. The barcode is the only part of these machine marked so called paper ballots that's counted as your vote. There is some small human readable text beneath the barcode. And proponents of these systems have said, well, voters can read that small human readable text and they'll notice, and that's what would be used in an audit or a recount. Well, guess what? In Georgia, which is one of the biggest proponents of these systems, there right now the official vote is counted as the barcode, not as the human readable text. So the the barcode would prevail. Whatever the barcode vote says would prevail in a in a recount. Um, not only that, studies have long shown that most voters don't review machine marked printouts, and that even when they review them, they miss the majority of errors. And in fact, a recent study from the University of Michigan showed that 93% of errors in that text, that human readable text, go unnoticed by voters. And this would be especially true as to down ballot races, which are so crucial this year because we are um, state lawmakers will be voting on, in 2021 on the new maps that will decide control or heavily impact control of the House of Representatives for the next decade. This is redistricting, gerrymandering, and all of that. So again, I'm coming back to this don't forget your sample ballot. That was really the um, takeaway from this study by the University of Michigan, was that the only thing that really improved the verifiability of this, um, of this human readable text was when voters had a completed um, sample ballot or sl completed slate of voters with them that they could compare against the printout. That's the only thing that really brought it up to significantly, the actual ability to notice if 
in particular, if, if races are just deleted, that's not the kind of state race, that's not the kind of thing most voters are going to notice. And this is what the experts recommended that, that we tell voters to do, and yet no one is really um, messaging this. So I am messaging it. Um, and I figure everybody loves dogs, so there's a cute dog to uh, help everyone remember, hopefully. As I said, down ballot races, especially state races, are critical this year because lawmakers will vote in 2021 on the new maps. And I discussed this with the um, chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party, David Pepper, who has written a series of frighteningly realistic, technically fiction novels about election hacking um, in the United States, hacking by foreign actors. And um, his books are fascinating. I really recommend them. They're, they really are educational because the vulnerabilities are, are very real, even if the events are technically fictional. But he, he was motivated, he said, to write these books because people are not focusing enough on state races and not focusing enough on how the control of the House of Representatives can be taken from us via these state races. And this really ties into my concerns about people not verifying their machine marked printouts for missing state races. Um, state races are also key to the Republican Party's longstanding desire to convene an Article V convention of states. And um, this convention of states would be effectively to rewrite the United States Constitution. Again, it's state legislatures that will decide this. The GOP is very focused on state races. They always have been, they continue to be. Incidentally, America's largest vendor, ESNS, accounts for 44% of US election equipment and has donated $30,000 to the Republican State Leadership Committee since 2013, whose mission is to take over state races by have Republicans take them over. Another tip, confirm your, vet, your voter registration several times between now and the election. Save a screenshot of the registration for confirmation as proof. Um, the reason for this is we need the screenshot is we need evidence. If we're going to be able to launch, if we need to file election challenges after this election, and I hope we don't, we are going to need evidence that fishy things went on. So we need things like screenshots, et cetera. And voter registration systems remain very vulnerable. Again, they connect to the internet and they were breached in 2016. And by the way, the FBI couldn't say with certainty whether data was altered or not. And I, I've spoken with experts who said that there would really be no way for them to know. So um, here's a phone number that everybody should know. And, and if somebody wants to start a postcard campaign, let me know, contact me at Jenny Cohn one on Twitter. COHN because this would be a really good one. It's the um, Lawyers Committee has an election protection hotline. They have it every year and this can give advice to voters who are having trouble at the polls. 1-866-OUR-VOTE. Everyone should know this number and if you have any kind of trouble voting, you should call it. The only thing I can say caveat I give about the election protection hotline is I typically does not make its numbers public. So it gets tons of phone calls. Um, it knows where the problems lie, but I don't believe it typically makes its numbers public. I hope they change that. But in the likelier event that they don't, we need again evidence. And this means you need to document it. You tell a poll worker if you run into problems, tell the local media, they will run, oftentimes they will run with these stories if they get enough phone calls and post it on social media because the local media is increasingly looking to social media, especially Twitter, to find out what's happening on election day. And I have taken to, you know, making long threads as each uh, primary come, well, not every primary, but some of them have come up and threading the problems and then reporters sometimes republish that. So feel free to tag me as well. And I will try to amplify whatever is going wrong so that we can fix it. Volunteer as poll workers. Um, we have heard a lot of messaging about voting in numbers too big to rig. I think that's somewhere around 60 to 70% is what I have heard. Um, perhaps can overcome vote flipping. I, I, that's not scientific. I've just heard that sort of through the grapevine. Um, but really our responsibility has to extend beyond that. And it's hard with COVID-19 if you are young and healthy, especially, um, it would be great if you can volunteer as a poll worker. And this really ties into voter suppression because the Republican Party wanted to close and has been closing polling places in large urban, largely Democratic areas anyway. COVID-19 gives them cover if there are no poll workers. So the best way to fight back against these poll closures is to um, have poll workers. And you can volunteer by contacting your state or county party so the Democratic Party, if you're a Democrat, the Republican Party, if you're a Republican, 
and asking to volunteer. Um, another thing we need are poll observers. It's, uh, it's a different category. You go and you watch at the polls and you can, um, there, you can do things like watching for voter intimidation. You can be trained to check and see if the zero tape, which tells you whether you don't want votes preloaded on the voting machines before voting starts. If you're a poll worker, if you're a poll observer, you are in a position to double check these things and you're not as busy, I guess, as the actual poll workers. So um, maybe you can make no more noise if there's a problem, but there are lots of things that you can check for. You can check the, um, well, I'll get to the poll tapes later, but you can also look for vote, just voter intimidation and um, help push back against that. Trump has said that he plans to deploy 50,000 poll monitors. He is prone to exaggerating, but I'm sure they will have a large team of poll monitors. This is sort of what Karl Rove's specialty is. He is working with Trump. So we need, um, the Democratic Party needs to have lots of poll workers and poll monitors as well. Poll observer is another word for it, poll watchers. And again, volunteer through your state or county political party. This is something that occurred to me as I'm telling everyone to sign up as a poll worker and a poll observer. I want to make sure that they're adequately protected. Our um, recent messaging from Dr. Fauci says that people who come into high contact with a lot of people, such as healthcare workers, should, in addition to a mask, be wearing face shields. I think we need to start messaging this for poll workers and poll observers. So it's not a replacement for a mask, it is in addition, they're plexiglass. We need a campaign of some sort for this. If you're um, you know, have the type of person that has a lot of self initiative and you're looking for something to message, uh, let me know and I can I can help direct you to people who have, you know, the email long email list for all election officials and that sort of thing. Because we really need to message getting these um, face shields for poll workers and observers. Um, I'm incredibly worried about electronic poll books. I mentioned this, they're tablet computers. They were traditionally used, um, well, they have been used for years in a small number of jurisdictions. They have really spiked in recent years. Much like the voting machine vendors, there are just a handful that have really sort of got an almost monopoly over the market. Um, the largest, No Inc., was founded by a former Republican election official from St. Louis. The product manager is a uh, supported Ed Martin in a campaign, and Ed Martin is the president of the Phyllis Shafley Eagles, which opposes the Equal Rights Amendment. This vendor is No Inc. It's in 25 states. Um, people will be deploying them in many places for the first time this year, which in and of itself is a recipe for disaster. And a lot of jurisdictions are going bare without paper, back at paper poll books. And we need to figure out where those jurisdictions are, number one, and then we need to demand that they have backups. There's no good excuse not to have them. The Coalition for Good no Governance, to my knowledge, is the only organization that has filed a lawsuit demanding backup paper poll books. They filed it in Georgia. And uh, we need to, I think especially the Democratic Party really needs to follow their lead and um, file some lawsuits. But we can also just get traction, I think, in many places just by making noise because it's common sense. These things connect to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. They're going down right and left. Georgia, Los Angeles County was massive chaos. Same vendor, no ink. They didn't have backups, neither did Georgia. Unacceptable. Um, yes, voters and voter protection groups should demand, and I've been messaging this for three years, that uh, election officials provide backup hand-marked paper ballots for these new touchscreen systems that they call paper ballot systems. Um, these touchscreen systems with the barcodes and the printout and everything, they can all break down. And so you need something that doesn't depend on a machine, hand-marked paper ballots. Um, I wish they hadn't bought those machines in the first place for use as a primary voting system at the polls. At least 20% of the U.S. did buy these machines. They need to have these um, backup hand-marked paper ballots. The Georgia Democratic Party has finally filed a lawsuit seeking them. I wish they had fought the machines to begin with, but... Here we are, hand-marked paper ballots. Um, here's something else, consolidated vote centers. Um, this is something that unfortunately Los Angeles County and even Democratic officials in Los Angeles County love the idea of, of closing all of our neighborhood polling places and consolidating them into these massive vote centers where everybody can vote anywhere in the county and um, 
The problem with that is it requires tech and it does not allow for backup paper poll books. It becomes logistically impossible. So these voters can vote anywhere in the county. Vote centers are a recipe for disaster. Um, if any, just Google what happened with Los Angeles County's primary. The, all throughout the US, there are pushes to move to this because of COVID-19. Do not let it happen. Even if we consolidate polling places, what you can do is combine six different polling places, for example, and have a corner for each. And then you can at least still have backup paper poll books, just like you would if it was neighborhood polling places. But if you jumble it all together with voters can vote anywhere, it, it doesn't work. So push, you have to really get involved with your county election um, officials and start attending their, their meetings, which are typically on Zoom now, and raise holy hell if you hear about these consolidated centers. Um, wireless modems in Florida, Michigan, and Wisconsin, they connect to the internet. We have enough problems with corrupt insiders. There's no reason to uh, make it easier for foreign hackers to use the internet to get into our systems. So we need to, even if we can't get rid of them, I think we need to make noise that they're there in case Trump or other uh, Republicans, or I guess Democrats too, if you're a Republican, you should know that there's wireless modems in these systems and they connect to the internet and that's not okay. And it's relevant to election challenges if they're needed. Try to get them removed. I think there may still be time. Um, digital ballot images. So. A group called Audit USA is doing really great work. The scanners for counting handmarked paper ballots are electronic as well. And this also applies by the way to mail voting. People often think that is not electronic, but the scanners still are electronic. The good news is many of them take images of the ballots as they're being scanned and images are much easier for the public to get through a Freedom of Information Act request or Public Information Act request because you can just get them on a USB drive and then try to at least compare some of the totals to the um, images that you get. But unfortunately, election officials are destroying them. They are automatically created, they are public records, and officials in Florida, many Florida counties are destroying them and uh, other places as well. Audit USA has a pending case to preserve them. It will likely be, de be decided next week. Protectourvotes.com is a group that I'm in with several women um, and we run, election security action items through it. And one that we're trying right now is photographing precinct poll tapes. So this is to protect the precinct totals that won't work for vote by mail. Um, but what you do is at the end of voting, voting machines generate, all of them should generate, a long strip of paper that gives all the vote totals for each machine. And um, what you can do is if you get those totals, you can compare them to the county reported totals for those precincts and make sure that they match up. And this is something that advocates are doing more and more that campaigns have resisted. But in, um, in Tennessee, in Shelby County, which is Memphis, an advocate and now election commissioner named Benny Smith used photographs of poll tapes to show that um, votes from predominantly black precincts were disappearing somewhere between the precincts and the county tabulator, ESNS systems, um, in 2015 and it caused a huge kerfuffle and the Republican election administrator who'd been investigated by the FBI resigned sort of under a cloud of suspicion. He retired, said it had nothing to do with this, but there was a big write up in, on it in Bloomberg. I wrote it up also more recently because precinct poll tape review also showed votes disappearing from predominantly black neighborhoods in Georgia in the 2018 Lieutenant Governor's race. So if you're interested in helping with this, it's really easy. You go after the precincts close, you bring your camera, you take a picture of these poll tapes, we, you upload it to our website, and then we have analysts who you can sign up to do that too, to help us analyze them and compare them to the reported totals. If nothing else, remember transparency. Um, we need transparency about, in particular, unexpected election losses. Um, so if your candidate loses, do not let them play dead. Democrats in particular love to play dead. They can't seem to concede fast, fast enough um, after suspicious election losses. Beto O'Rourke would be a perfect example of this. I love the guy, but he rolled over way too quick, quickly, especially given all of the media attention with um, you know, vote flipping touchscreens. And finally, if you want more information about election system vulnerabilities, you can check my Twitter account, which is at Jenny Cone one and most of my published articles, and there are a lot of them, and most of my interviews, there are quite a few of those as well, 
are in the library section at protectourvotes.com and I've added a section which includes um, videos, articles, and books from other sources. It includes Jonathan Simon's books. It includes um, David Pepper's books. He's the head of the Ohio Democratic Party I mentioned. And um, so anyway, that's a really good resource for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer Cohn, for that very comprehensive and urging us towards uh, being proactive uh, in terms of our situation here. And I would like to turn it briefly to uh, our other panelists that they have uh, input here, um, but we're a little bit behind, so I'd like to make sure that we uh, get to uh, Senator Worth's presentation before too long. And j just at the end there, uh, Jennifer, you touched on um, the question of not letting uh, Democrats go lie limp, basically, after these things are over. And so I'd just like to uh, bring up a, a question from the audience by Josh Middeldorf about why do you think the Democrats have been so shy about calling out a system that is rigged uh, against them? And because as we've seen that it's not just a uh, code red coming from the right. And I would also urge people to look at, at your Twitter thread, uh, Jennifer, in terms of some of the really incredible threads you've done around such groups as the Council for National Policy, that it really is an institutional backstop in many ways for some of this vast right wing conspiracy, as it might properly right. be called. But at the same time, we see over and over again, whether it's 2004, the Senator Worth uh, referred to in terms of time with John, John Kerry, um, or more recently, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in this uh, primary, the Democrats seem to uh, roll over so quickly. And maybe we'll have more time to touch on this after the Senator's presentation, but I just wanted to bring that into the fold. Jonathan, you have uh, some input here? Oh, oh, that's... oh, Jennifer, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I did. I did want to say something about that. So certainly there is a don't you don't want to appear as a sore loser mentality. And I, I feel like um, the Democrats have kind of caved to Republican messaging on that. They probably taunt them, you know, make them think like well, we're going to call you a sore loser. And so the Democrats say, oh, no, we don't want to be a sore loser. I think with John Kerry, it was partly that he has said it was because um, it would just end up in the Supreme Court again. And, you know, we saw how that ended out with with the Gore election. Um, but I also think he wanted to be Secretary of State. And I have to say what makes me really angry about that, and he felt it would destroy his career basically if he came out and um, suggested that our elections weren't legitimate, even if perhaps they weren't legitimate. He has said now about 15 years later that they actually did suspect electronic vote tally manipulation in 20, 2004, but he waited all this time and he only said it you know, very, very quietly to Brian Lair. There's a little teeny passage in his book um, I think he wanted to be Secretary of State, and okay, that's great. But, you know, he was Secretary of State under Obama in 2016, and he also remained quiet about the fact that Russia was in a position to change vote tallies. And I'm not okay with that. I'm I am a Democrat. I am a what probably a lot of people would have called a centrist Democrat. So, you know, Kerry supporter and everything. I am not okay with being misled and not being told these key facts. And I think um, it was partly career progression. And there's there's a lot of group think that says we that prioritizes trust in elections ahead of having trustworthy elections. And that is ridiculous and not okay. And it is the largely the it has been the predominating viewpoint in 2016, but the problem is you never get anything fixed if you aren't honest and public about it, especially if you're dealing with bad actors. To think that you can finesse a possibly illegitimate election and that it will then become fixed under that administration is the height of, um, I don't know the word, <laughs> naivete. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so any, in any event, I think we need honesty and transparency about elections. I don't think people expect our elections to be perfect, they expect people they trust to be honest and open with them when things when problems arise. Jonathan, were you uh, uh, seeking to weigh in here? Perhaps just just one observation, and that is, you know, picking up on what Jennifer just said is that, you know, in many ways, when you step back and you look at the big picture of all this, and, you know, I did spend some time in Washington, and senators spent some time in Washington, and there are idealists and there are many people that go to state government and local government, federal government, certainly with the idea of serving the public. Um, 
as their number one impetus. But somehow, what it seems to have broken down to and what we're facing now in such a, you know, um, a dramatic way um, is that democracy in many ways to the people who are running the democracy, democracy itself is something of a pain in the ass. Um, so there is a certain amount of the public as the enemy. And we can see that on so many fronts in terms of, you know, spin is everything. What is revealed to the public is, is carefully curated um, on, on so, so many fronts. And really you have corporations sitting down with politicians sitting down with the media and crafting stories. And I'm not a particularly, you know, deep state conspiracy type. I think I just sort of keep focused on the elections. But you can kind of see this general, I mean, we've observed enough with the elections to see how it kind of operates from individual to individual to group, to collectivity of groups, that there is a genuine sense that if the public actually knew what was in the sausage, we'd be in trouble. So there's a really strong bias um, and, it, and it winds its way through all this decision-making to kind of keep the lid on. And it's really uh, led to this really crisis situation that we're in now. I know we're really pressed for time. I just wanna say really quickly, um, I too am very concerned that Trump will lose and refuse to concede, but I'm all equally concerned that he will um, cheat to win and that Democrats may be backing themselves into a corner just like they did in 2016 with overblown claims about how impossible it would be to rig vote by mail or rig in-person voting. It's not, if there's a way Trump will, Trump, Trump is the type who would be able to find it. And I just think you, we have to be a little more subtle in our messaging and not back ourselves into a corner where if we need to file, if Democrats need to file an election challenge, they'll look like hypocrites if they do that. It's tricky. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Worth, any um, uh, comments or questions quickly on, on Jennifer's presentation before we uh, move to you? Well, I think it's very, I think what uh, Jennifer was offering was very important. Uh, I think the public is in large sick and tired of having problems thrown at them. They're overwhelmed by problems of COVID and the economy and getting their kids back in school and so on. And it's incumbent upon all of us who are thinking about elections to be able to tell people what they can do and that they can act. And that's, that's extraordinarily important and will be more and more important as we move toward November 3rd. So I appreciate your 20 points, Jennifer. I think you may be unfair and unwarranted in what you're suggesting about John Kerry's decision in 2004. Uh, he really believed that it was uh, uh, going to go to the courts and that there was no way that there was going to change. And, and, uh, it had nothing to do with his, uh, with his be, become, wanting to become the Secretary of State later on down the line. It doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't fit, I don't think. But anyway, I appreciate your, your, your many points. Whether it was thrown out in the courts or not, the truth matters. And the fact that we're hearing it 14 years later as opposed to back then, you know, the problem never got solved. So. Well, I mean, that uh, whatever you heard, you know, is just not the case. Up next, we have former Senator Timothy E. Worth on what if Trump loses in 2020, refuses to leave office, and what we can do about it, addressing his recent Newsweek article titled, How Trump Could Lose the Election and Still Remain President. Timothy E. Worth is a former congressman and senator from Colorado. Recently, he and a group of similarly concerned citizens have been working to shed light on the potential dangers awaiting us in the 2020 election as discussed in his Newsweek article. Worth began his political career as a White House fellow under President Lyndon Johnson and served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Education in the Nixon administration. In 1970, Worth returned to his home state of Colorado and successfully ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in 1974. He represented the Denver suburbs from 75 to 87. Worth was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1986, where he focused on environmental issues, particularly global climate change and population stabilization. Following these two decades of elected politics, Worth was national co-chair of the Clinton-Gore campaign and from 93 to 97 served in the U.S. Department of State as the first undersecretary 
for Global Affairs. Senator Timothy Wirth, please uh, bless us with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, um, emceeing the program. It's incredibly interesting. And I look forward to following up with both of our, our panelists. Our group began to come together about four months ago, uh, concerned that uh, Trump, you know, was beginning, we were beginning to see indications that Trump might be up to various illegal or unconventional activities to keep himself in office. Trump has the words, one word in Trump's vocabulary, which above all others he fears, and that's the word loser. And the idea, uh, if you can imagine Trump uh, accepting the fact that uh, he would be the largest and most prominent loser in American political history uh, gives you a sense of how aggress aggressively he's going to battle to keep himself uh, to keep himself in office. We have uh, we are a group of Republicans and Democrats who've come together, uh, looking at the various pathways that he can follow uh, to keep himself in office. And uh, we have a lot of material on our website, which is called keeparrepublic.com. That's keeparrepublic.com, obviously uh, reflecting Ben Franklin's uh, famous statement at the end of the Constitutional Convention. If you look at this election and in the broadest sense, there are two pathways uh, that Trump can follow. Uh, one of those is seating, is the electoral process and uh, seating uh, uh, S E E D I N G seeding uh, chaos along the way, which he is well on his way to doing. And the other is the invocation of the vast uh, uh, number of secret emergency powers, which he holds and which he can invoke uh, when we get uh, toward the uh, middle of December and into January. On the chaos side, I think it's pretty clear that we can all see what he's doing. Uh, see what's happening in terms of the Postal Service and attempting to erode uh, the Postal Service's capability. Uh, this is remarkable at a time when there are two institutions in America today that have the public's respect, uh, the military and the post office, and he's taking on uh, the uh, post office friendly. And uh, at the same time, which people aren't really watching very carefully, uh, putting a lot of his cronies in in the top civilian levels of the of the military and you wonder, you know, what's that all about? Why is he doing that? Uh, look, we'll come back to connecting the dots. Uh, in the chaos area, it's particular, it's important for us to focus on where the action's gonna be and that's in the uh, six or eight swing states, particularly uh, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Arizona, and maybe uh, Iowa and Georgia. Uh, those are the states where the election will be won or lost. And uh, uh, going to Florida, for example, it's pretty clear, I, don't, I think, that uh, Trump can't win the election in a legitimate way if he uh, loses Florida. He has to win Florida. Uh, Pennsylvania, on the other hand, is very much of a, an important key state for, for Democrats. Uh, Democrats can put together an electoral majority elsewhere, but it's uh, extremely difficult to do in Pennsylvania without Pennsylvania. So it's a focus on Pennsylvania and that's where uh, they are focused as well. And if you look at the uh, uh, litigation of lawsuits which are being uh, led by the, uh, the uh, loyalists in the uh, Trump organization, they're, they're focused very heavily in Pennsylvania, uh, trying to really threaten the way in which uh, votes are gonna be counted there and really uh, pushing back on the regular electoral process, which in Pennsylvania is already, uh, which is already uh, uh, very uneven in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a lot of work going on there. Everybody should have a lot of work going on there uh, to try to uh, shore up uh, what's happening in Pennsylvania. And that's gonna be extremely important. In Michigan and Wisconsin, I think going back to, uh, to uh, maybe Jonathan's earlier presentation, if you look at the undervote in, which in um, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, it's very striking that in the uh, 2016 election, uh, there was a very significant gap between uh, people who voted and uh, voted all together, but didn't vote for uh, the top of the ticket. There were gaps of tens of thousands of votes. Very, very unusual that people would go in, vote, but not vote for the top of the ticket. Particularly, this is true, it looks like this is true 
in areas that uh, uh, would be predominantly Democratic and Hillary voters where people didn't vote. I don't know, Jonathan, if you all have looked at that. Uh, that uh, seems to me a very important variable uh, to understand you know, about rigging elections and what can be done there. Well, going through then, looking at the, the elections themselves and the pathway to chaos, uh, it looks pretty clear that Trump is attempting to do everything he can to get us to a point where uh, majorities can't be easily decided or quickly decided uh, in the uh, elections in these swing states, particularly the, the big six. Uh, he is pressing that Florida happen quickly. Uh, you heard his uh, uh, bout face uh, earlier this week on Florida voting where he says, oh, it's great to vote by mail in Florida, but elsewhere it isn't good. Uh, that's because he, he, he's very, very eager to have the Florida vote come in and to have vote by mail come in in Florida, uh, as that's going to be the, the bedrock of his, of his uh, majority, if he can get to a majority of the, elect of the Electoral College. So getting to the Electoral College and the electors uh, have to be decided by the states in the first week of December. And uh, the, that has to come from states uh, verifying, certifying, and verifying the elections in their states and then choosing the electors who are then get to, gonna get together in the middle of December when the Electoral College meets. If those, <clears throat> if, uh, uh, those electors, there, there can't be a decision on those electors if states are up in the air and are, are, can't decide uh, what, what, who their electors are, then go to the Electoral College and you get to the point, in fact, and this is the purpose, this is the point uh, of our Newsweek article, come to the point where the electors can't get, to, you're not gonna have a majority of the electoral votes in the middle of December. Uh, then it goes through a very torturous process uh, in the House and in the Senate in, in that month between the middle of December and uh, the early part of January, at which point the new, new uh, delegations will be uh, sworn in or new members of the House and the Senate will be sworn in and the House and the Senate then uh, move to, will, will be, uh, 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 it would be up to the House and the Senate to determine uh, which states and which electoral votes can and should be counted. In all of this, Trump can um, put a great deal of pressure on a few states uh, to be sticking with him when the, elect when the electoral votes are counted. And uh, in particular, it, it's important to say, what, what will uh, the Senate do and what will the House do? Uh, in the Senate, it's obviously a state by uh, a state by state vote, and we can see uh, what the what the uh, votes in the Senate will be. Uh, with uh, a swing of five Democratic votes in the Senate, we would guarantee that the Senate votes in January in the, for the Electoral College would be Democratic. It's very important to keep in mind that these five states, uh, 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 if you take out Alabama and assume that even in the middle of uh, January. Uh, that, um, uh, that Vice President will still be Pence. You need five votes for the Senate to have a majority for the Democratic side and a Democratic slate if it gets to that problem in the middle of January. On the Republican side, uh, the votes are decided on the, I mean, the House of Representatives side, the votes are decided uh, House by uh, district, state by state. Uh, Wyoming has the same vote as Wyoming, as uh, California, for example. So when those um, when the votes come in right now, if we if we looked at uh, how those states would vote, it would be 26, uh, 24, uh, essentially a Republican majority. And it's important to keep in mind that a, um, a swing of five uh, states uh, of five states would would change that mix so that there would be a guarantee that the Democrats would control the votes in the in the Electoral College. So the Electoral College pathway is very complicated, and, and uh, uh, we, we lay out some of that in the Newsweek article and other pieces that have been, that have been uh, added to the mix and can be found on our website. Uh, to, com to, com to complete the complexity of this, the president also has vast secret emergency powers, which uh, the populace and the country, the country overall knows very little about. These were emergency powers granted to the president by the Congress, initially uh, in fear of what would happen with the displacement of the government at a time of a nuclear emergency during the Eisenhower era. Those then expanded uh, uh, to 
consider chemical and biological warfare, what would happen then, expanded then to uh, include terrorism, and finally, uh, emergency powers related to uh, the potential pandemic. According to the Brennan Center in New York, uh, Trump has uh, at least 100 of these emergency powers. Uh, they, have not, they have not been uh, vetted publicly uh, in any fashion. And we've been working with the Congress to try to get uh, the speaker to, uh, to have hearings on these at least so that people would know what powers Trump might have uh, and be able to invoke uh, worry to say that the uh, pandemic has infected votes in a particular, particular area. Were you to say that uh, the communication is so bad that he's shutting down the internet, which he has the authority to do, if he invokes emergency powers, be emergency powers because of some uh, anticipated foreign uh, adventure that would cause him to uh, nationalize the National Guard around the country. There are a whole series of these emergency powers, uh, which he has, uh, and over which the Congress has no control whatsoever. So it's important to understand what these are and for people to be talking about what these emergency powers are. And again, we're trying to do that. To say where we are overall, when we started this four months ago, we thought all of these, uh, these two major themes of uh, uh, chaos of the polls and the use of emergency powers were possible. And uh, over the last uh, four months, the closer we moved to November 3rd, the more we're moving all of this from the possible into the probable category. If we look what the president is already doing, how he is invoking uh, his attacks on the post office, how he is attempting to sow chaos during the uh, electoral process, and what he's threatening with Barr, through Barr, and independently on the uh, use of these emergency powers, we believe that it uh, looks like we're in for a very, very rocky time, uh, not only up to November 3rd, but from November 3rd to the middle of December and the uh, uh, electoral college uh, 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 considerations. And then finally, probably maybe even into January. So finally, what can be done? Going to uh, what uh, Jennifer is urging us to think about what can citizens do? Uh, there are a number of important things and Jennifer, you mentioned many of those of citizens having to be aware of this. Uh, well, this is gonna require what we say a vast uh, citizens firewall against this. There are no legal constraints to what Trump can do. It's going to demand a vast citizens firewall, including uh, all the elected officials at the state, county, and local level. Uh, we're attempting to get uh, a, lot of, a lot of the business groups very concerned with this and the possible chaos and what that would mean economically and how they have to be alert and working on this. Obviously, uh, people in the pundit and political position is suggested and um, political commentary, as suggested earlier, Democrats tend to lie over and uh, let things go by. Or as uh, my colleague Dick Kebhart says, where Democrats are excellent at whistling past the graveyard while the Republicans are working very hard and they certainly are aware of all of the th these things and are probably way ahead of the Democrats in terms of, uh, what, in terms of what they are doing, what they're planning and how they plan to do this. So the citizens firewall, including many of the elements that Jennifer talked about are absolutely imperative. Um, finally, we think we've made some very real progress in terms of alerting people. Uh, again, when we were first raising this three months ago, people said, oh, you're just an alarmist. That cannot happen here and so on. I think increasingly people are aware of the fact that very, very severe challenges are gonna occur uh, over the next 90 days and then in the two months afterward, and we have to be not only alert to them, but doing everything we can, possibly can to organize against them. So let me stop at that and thank you all very much and uh, look forward to any questions that people may have and then the comments of uh, my colleagues on the panel. Thank you very much. So much, Senator Wirth, for the uh, game theory, maybe even the election war game theory that we need to be considering in yeah. terms of this proposal for we the people as an election firewall. And isn't that the beginning, the births of the republic are not, are, are in many ways prior to its uh, constitution. And remember what George W. Bush called the constitution and that it depends on the base of the shoulders of we the people. And ultimately that is where any proper rule of law 
and uh, elections and governance might come from is from us. And so thank you for urging us uh, on. Well, I mean, that's absolutely right. And we have to depend upon goodwill. You know, that's what's made the transfer of power work in the country in the past. Uh, Trump does not understand, I don't think in any way, the norms and protocols that have governed the way in which our democracy operates. We can't expect him to. So we have to adapt that mode ourselves and really work on it, as you suggest, and uh, make sure that the selection and peaceful transfer of power occurs. Uh, it's not going to happen without citizen engagement. Thank you. And I'd like to open it up to our other panelists, Jennifer Cohn and Jonathan Simon, if they have uh, input, want to weigh in here. Jennifer. I, I do. Number one, great presentation. And uh, number two, I love the phrase citizen firewall. And um, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to start using it. That's, that's Please do. Please do. It's, it's very catchy. I, I was hoping to get your thoughts on the concern that I raised about backing the Democrats possibly backing themselves into a corner where um, they will look like hypocrites if they file an election challenge should Trump prevail. Do you have oh, I think that, that? I, I think that the uh, landscape is going to be littered with election challenges of all kinds. And I wouldn't worry about, you know, if the Democrats have they are our ones offering an election challenge. There are going to be so many of them. But they didn't do They're it in 2016. Excuse me? They didn't do it in 2016. And well, they a, I think people are so alert to... now, Jennifer. I think you're uh, looking backwards at history that you interpretation, your interpretations of some history in the past. I think that, you know, I know the Biden election is deeply concerned about this. The, there are uh, batteries of lawyers in all coming into all of the swing states major electoral uh, analyses of these. And, and uh, uh, if we get to the time for a challenge, certainly the Democrats are going to do that. Uh, think so? would, uh, okay. What would happen ultimately, what would happen if, if uh, Trump ends up with a majority of the electoral votes and is certified as the, uh, as the next president of the United States, you know, that could, that could well happen in the middle of January. Uh, that could well happen. I mean, that's, it's, it's, not a not a not a, an improbability at all. Uh, then what would happen? Would the Democrats defy uh, that kind of? And it went to the Supreme Court, and the court said uh, that he has been duly elected. He's gone through all of these different hoops, uh, and he's been duly elected. Then would the Democrats challenge that? I think that's totally uh, 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 unclear turf, and it's it's uh, in my view hard to believe that they that they would at that point. We're so far down the line, but I don't know what, it'd be interesting to hear what, what Jonathan thinks about this. Yeah, if I could just respond really briefly though. I, I don't think I am a, I, I go by the, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think very much the fact that the Democrats have rolled over again and again and again, that I have every right and everyone has every reason to be legitimately concerned that the Democrats will do the exact same thing in 2020. I spoke with the head of the voter protection unit at the, of the Beto campaign. We begged them. I had uh, Lawrence Tribe on the phone. I had with me others begging them to at least look at the poll tapes. Nothing. There is something culturally that, or that in the mentality thus party that has to change. Um, every single, every Democrat just rolled right over. Even Stacey Abrams. Rhetorically, which is a huge deal, she did not concede. Legally, she conceded. And the lieutenant governor's race, it, was, it took the Coalition for Good Governance to actually look at the poll tapes and see that, they, that 127,000 votes from predominantly black neighborhoods had disappeared. The Abrams campaign didn't do it. There, and I think it was pressure probably from the Democratic Party. Something is wrong. So I am very, very concerned. And um, I'm very concerned that John Kerry, after what happened to him in 2004, was part of the Obama administration and not telling people that Russia was in a position to alter vote tallies in 2016. That cannot happen in 2020 again. The public has to know because our last, we're talking about a citizen firewall, the, the most important firewall of all, and really the last one right of protest. And the public can't protest that which it doesn't know. And if we don't trust the public with this information, we are taking away their most basic right. That's it. Well, I don't, I don't just, you know, what you're saying is, of course, the public has a right to protest and you have a right to, people have a right to be very skeptical about what's been done they historically. They have a right to know. I, they have a right to know. Would, of course. And I would uh, share that. I'm, I'm just not, 
I'm not conspiratorial, but rather looking ahead. What do we have to do to build the citizen? What did power I say that was conspiratorial? What do we have to What do we have to do to be sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, to defend the republic? You know, against the incursions of this guy and getting him out of office. That's all right. Just to clarify, we're suggesting that what I have said is conspiratorial is the exact mentality that I'm talking about. It is not conspiratorial. Jennifer, let's let's. I don't know. to know that vote tallies were very much within the realm of Russia's ability to um, alter in the 2016. It does I not make me a conspiratorial person to say that. I it's think it, that is true. I raised that point with Jonathan. I agree. I don't know what's happened. What we know, for example, about the undervotes in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, which were so striking, and we ought to know about those and what happened there. That's a very Interesting question. I don't know, Jonathan, if you all looked at that and know about that. And I would like to turn to Jonathan. Um, I would like to in on this topic specifically in terms of what we can learn and what will we what we must learn potentially from the history in this country uh, in terms of these elections. Uh, there is an article crucial and not really much addressed from 2018 by Bob Fatrakis and Harvey Wasserman titled Convicted Trump Putin consigliere Paul Manafort linked to Ohio's stolen 2004 election, which deals very directly with the background of both 2004 being orchestrated via uh, Rove's IT guru, Mike Connell. It's been brought up in our, our chats, too, uh, about, by Susie Hart about how Mike Connell's company, uh, Go, uh, GovTech, SmartTech, and the Carl Rove connected SmartTech servers, they had control uh, in relationship to the Ohio uh, state, um, in, um, the Ohio state uh, in terms of the 2004 elections. Of course, we're talking about uh, Secretary of State, I believe at that time, Ken Blackwell, who is part of the uh, Council for National Policy, was also then appointed by Trump to his alleged election integrity panel, along with uh, our former Secretary of State here in Kansas, uh, Chris Kobach who is a part of this uh, net network, it appears. And, uh, and one last piece of this that points to some backing for what Jennifer is talking about in terms of uh, both the, uh, the rolling over in the moment by Democrats, in that case, John Kerry, um, Mark Crispin Miller, who's done work on this, uh, uh, this area, written a book about it, been basically held out of most of the media uh, after doing so on the topic has disclosed that he spoke directly with Senator Kerry ab about this uh, in the wake of uh, 2004, a few years after, and that Kerry did know about the, had indications of the election fraud, um, and then denied that th that had been uh, said behind the scenes. So there is this problem of the public versus the private in terms of what we the people need to know the motivations, I believe, are sort of besides the point, potentially, in terms of what the totality of the calculus was. What's the most important thing, I believe, here is that we, the people, do have the right to know and that we might even demand of the people who are running for office, especially at the presidential level, that they actually tell us what they actually believe about the mechanisms of democracy in the moment when it matters in order to back us up to so that we have the knowledge and potentially the legal standing to be able to back up uh you know in, either in protests or demonstrations or direct action to be able to take that kind of uh action and then final point in terms of this article that talks about mike connell and who, by the way, went down in a play, a suspicious plane crash in the middle of uh, legal d deliberation, basically, uh, into the matter of 2004 election fraud, that Manafort was apparently working with Mike Connell, not only in the United States, in the heart of the United States in Ohio, to uh, fraud up the 2004 election, but also in Ukraine. Uh, in relationship to the Ukrainian uh, elections and all the shenanigans surrounding all of that. And so there is this documented history, again, of a potentially transnational conjunction of interests that are represented by domestic election fraud combined with aspects that are much more uh, international. I, I uh, turn it over to whoever uh, wants to. Well, I... Um... <clears throat> If I had money to bet uh, on the 
uh, Jennifer and Senator Worth uh, prognosis, I'd probably go with Jennifer based on what I've seen, the evidence that we've uncovered and what we've seen the Democrats do. Uh, however, I would say that we really, we really are in uncharted territory. We don't know. Um, truth can be stranger than fiction. We have those great books by David Pepper. There's another one just come out, 42 Million to One by Hal Malchow. Uh, there were a couple of preceding books by other authors all about one form or another of election theft. And, uh, you know, they are certainly no stranger than Code Red or than the evidence that we've seen uh, and what we're looking at going into the next few months. Uh, it has become what we would think of as surrealistic. And one of the reasons we think of it as being surrealistic is that we have absolutely come to take democracy for granted. Uh, we were born into it. Uh, the vast majority of us who were born in this country were born into a democracy, a stable democracy. We just assume that's the way it is. But uh, historically, that's it's, it's more fragile than that. Uh, democracy is an aspiration more often uh, than it is a stable reality. And we're seeing that, you know, in human nature with the quest for power. And uh, I mean, obviously, you, you can throw into that uh, psychopaths like uh, like Trump. Uh, but even without Trump, uh, the quest for power and preceding Trump um, is such that democracy can often be seen as an impediment, uh, not an enabler. Uh, and the public is is uh, is best, you know, kept satisfied, kept quiet, kept confident, confident in the result of our elections. Um, the word conspiracy, of course, is a trigger word here because uh, those of us who have worked hard to gather data and analyze it and present that evidence have been treated. Uh, like conspiracy theorists, uh, as much as if we said there were, you know, aliens running the State Department, or uh, people were walking around with chips in their head or whatever. I mean, there's very little separation of wheat or, you know, wheat and chaff. And it's very easy to, uh, to, to use that word to kind of dismiss uh, 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 things that are, are, are um, not theories, but are actually fact based, not every conspiracy. Um, is, is a theory, but we've come into a place now where we're in a special, there's an, a special challenge. I, I wouldn't blame anybody for being absolutely freaked out uh, because you've had this manipulator come on the scene, very brazen manipulator in Donald Trump, who is basically spewing along with OANN and Fox News and his, his, his lick spittles, um, are absolutely spewing conspiracy theories right and left. And so it's given conspiracy theories a bad name. Uh, you have an evidence-based presentation of uh, problems and red flags. Uh, how is that to be uh, seen as different from some nonsense uh, that they're chucking out there like about voter fraud or something without a single shred of evidence for it? And in the public sphere, and especially with media being very, very, um, devoted to the idea of treating everything equally and making no judgments on anything. And you can have a whole big debate and session on that. Um, they become kind of uh, difficult to distinguish. And if you, you know, and if you look at who we're talking to here, I mean, we're talking to a, a handful of, of people who have been concerned enough to take Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, as may be the case, um, and spend it in a very unpleasant way, looking at some very unpleasant things. Um, and uh, most of you are probably somewhere in the choir uh, in terms of your degree of concern about elections. Um, and everybody else is out. I mean, it's COVID, so they're not out uh, watching NFL games or doing what people uh, usually do. But they're certainly not here. And so we can talk and we can discuss about what there is to do and what uh, everybody should do. And I, and I hope that, that as, you know, as an archive, as a record, uh, our presentations will, will get, you know, more spread, more, more eyeballs. Um, but the reality is that it's, it, you've got, this is going to depend on a citizen's firewall and you've got, the vast, vast majority of the public not grasping, not recognizing what is in play here. 
Um, yes, many think uh, that Donald Trump is a dangerous man. But in terms of the specifics, and this is where, you know, what Senator Worth has done and what the group has done in gaming out these scenarios is really critical and absolutely must get uh, disseminated. Um, because when it really comes to specifics, people are really unprepared. And it may go to vast uh, protests, maybe economic actions, all sorts of uh, uprising. I mean, secessions have even been uh, gamed out in, in this scenario. Donald Trump, of all people, thrives on this kind of chaos. And that's why I said, you know, very early in this presentation, there's a bit of heads I win, tails you lose about this. Um, because we have been pushed to a point by our own neglect, w w whether it's uh, John Kerry or, you know, a, 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 the news uh, media or... John Ossoff uh, running in the Georgia sixth election or Hillary Clinton, um, individual decisions made in many cases for rational reasons, combining into a collective neglect where we have prioritized many other things ahead of the health and survival of this democracy. And we are now in the ICU and there's a ventilator and we're wringing our hands and it is late in the game. And with any, you know, good luck, uh, if God drops everything else, maybe there will be a citizen's firewall and we will be able to finally stand up. And maybe from that will come reforms and, and uh, actions that are taken to address the vulnerabilities of this electoral system, maybe some other processes that are in trouble. Maybe it'll be like a post Watergate. But again, if I had money to put down on the table, uh, that's a long shot bet. That's the reality. That is a long shot bet. And I want to see, I mean, I hope there are 100 million people in the streets and I hope they won't take it lying down if there's some sort of uh, fraud that changes outcomes and changes results, or if there is a refusal to accept uh, electoral results. And, we, and we've broken down all the laws and we've broken down the democratic process. I hope the people will come out and prioritize this and not prioritize anything else. But that is a hope. It's hardly a confidence. Well, I think that's very nicely stated. And I'm sorry, Jennifer, if my word use of the word conspiracy turned out to be misinstru- uh, you know, I, I'm a, a believer that uh, I, I was, that uh, I'm, there's a conspiracy among the Trump people to get really to uh, take over our democracy and keep him in power for a long period of time. And I think all of us want to do everything we possibly can uh, to stop that. And uh, that's what we're trying to do with keep our republic and the, building the citizens firewall and trying to alert as many people as we possibly can uh, to this. And I think this discussion today is, is really helpful. I look forward to going back on your 20 suggestions and uh, looking at uh, Jonathan's analyses. And Jeremy, thank you very much for holding us all together here. Oh yeah, thank And I do, I do have one or two closing comments as well. Um, I just, I do not, I'm not in the predictions business. Um, I do not have a prediction for who is going to be declared the winner or will Trump steal it through fraud or will he, you know, steal it through refusing to concede. I don't know which one of these scenarios oops, is going to play out, but, um, but I'm very concerned about all of them. And the only thing that I am certain of is that we are taking risks that we shouldn't take. And I do feel very strongly that transparency is the only way to actually have trust in the election outcome, no matter which way it goes. And we need to demand more rather than less. And I appreciate the apology. Words like, to use the word conspiracy theorist against me when I am not one of the ones who even claims to know that any particular election has been stolen. I just think there are, is reason for concern. That to me is the reason why we will not have protests in the street. Because it isn't just you, it's, it's, it's many people sort of the adults in the room who've been around since Gore do tend to dismiss these concerns as conspiracies on occasion. And um, I just, I think we need to just rethink how we think about it. Yes, we shouldn't say we have 
proof definitively if we don't have proof definitively, and I don't claim to have that. But God, there is cause for concern. And yes, we need to learn from our history. Um, it, you know, looking backward is a way of looking forward in a meaningful way. And these tips that I put forward, they're kind of a pain in the neck. And frankly, manual audits, which is what we really should have had, are a huge pain in the neck. And the idea that people would implement that without really knowing that we may have had, may, may, not definitely, may have had previously pro compromised presidential elections is, I think, not Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, conversation and uh, we will continue it, but I want to make sure that we have 20 minutes left here and I want to make sure that we're going to go to uh, questions and answers from our audience right now. Uh, I'm going to read a few uh, comments, questions from the Q&A, but we are going to, do we have one hand up uh, from participant Sparky Landers who we're going to bring into the Zoom session. And uh, be, before we go to Sparky Landers, I would just... Uh, um, point out the logistics. Uh, after you come into the forum, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera down in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, focus your camera on your face and then please ask a, a, a short question uh, without too much of a speech. And, uh, and we will get to it. Um, so in, in the uh, Q&A, I want to just read Susie Hart's comment and question here. I am researching a rash of election officials resigning or being forced to resign in all of the smoke of the new electronic equipment installations. Some of these are due to COVID, but some is pressure from party hacks. Election officials need our support. Is there going to be a transcript of, of this forum? Okay, good question. I, um, and then um, the uh, the uh, Janet in the in the forum asks the second question for all panelists. This panel is all white. What actions might the Black Lives Matter movement take that could impact the election, and how can they be brought to the conversation? Okay. And then finally, I'm going to read one last question here, and then uh, and then we'll see if we're ready to go to um, our uh, live questioner or whether the panelists want to weigh in on some of these questions. By Carol Brulier, and I was going to bring it, uh, up this uh, article. I'm glad that she brought it up. Uh, Carol says, uh, there was an article by Whitney Webb entitled, quote, Operation Blackout why a shadowy tech firm with ties to Israeli intelligence is running doomsday election simulations. Um, a shadowy tech firm with deep ties to Israeli intelligence and newly in contracts to protect Pentagon computers is partnering with Lockheed Martin to gain unprecedented access to the heart of America's democracy. Her article details election day simulations with people killed and injured, martial law declared, and the election being canceled back in January. Have you looked into her work and who is manipulating the public and the media? And Whitney published that article actually January 4th, where it seemed sort of to be a potential conspiracy theory, actually, that there would be these kind of serious questions being posed in Newsweek uh, by former uh, senators about the potential for chaos and uh, unprecedented uh, uh, indecision or a lack of a orderly transition in relationship to the 2020 elections, um, but it's becoming more front and center. And so the, these these uh, live these sort of live fly drills of election day chaos were being run uh, uh, earlier on last year. Okay, um, any any responses to uh, any of these uh, these questions or comments before we turn to uh, Sparky uh, Lander's question, Jonathan? And then Jennifer. Okay, I, I, just on Whitney, I, I had the pleasure and privilege of editing Whitney for a couple of years. And I will say that her work is very, very um, solid and uh, well-researched and that these gamings uh, do go on. Um, now, not everything that gets gamed out happens, uh, but it shows that there is a, a you know, a, the, the, the smart money um, is recognizing uh, that we are in this new uncharted territory uh, and somewhat ahead of the general public. Um, so, you know, there is a lot to that. And on the uh, Black Lives Matter, um, and uh, we um, are all white, um, there are connections uh, that have been made and that are being made um, across 
racial groups and across ethnic groups. Uh, LeBron James, uh, I think most notably, has uh, formed an organization, More Than a Vote, um, to work on the issue of voter suppression, especially as targeted at voters of color. Um, there's a lot they don't know because uh, it takes a while to get up to speed in this area and to know uh, all the tricks. So there's a, certainly a lot of room for synergy there uh, between those who have the megaphone, certainly somebody like LeBron has, has, a, has a big megaphone, and those who have the experience. And the trick is to sort of get rid of the silos, recognize that this is a crisis where really people have to work together, uh, put aside issues of turf and put aside issues of, you know, relatively minor disagreement and really, really work cooperatively. And that's something we're, we look forward to doing. It's something we're definitely going to have to do if we're going to have any chance of success. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, what I wanted to say is, is um, I have found actually that the African American community is quite receptive to these concerns. And in some cases, I would say more so than, than white people, um, perhaps because they have a history of having their votes taken from them. And it's not shocking to them that this would occur, whereas, you know, if traditionally the, the um, power has been, has been consolidated and, you know, white males, a lot of them go to the same country clubs as maybe some of these Republican operatives. But, so it, it's hard for people who have sort of thrived in this society to fathom that maybe their own votes are under attack. It's kind of a new thing for them and they don't realize it. And I found the NAACP has been quite receptive to concerns about the new tech, these new touchscreen voting machines. And I believe they fought, they joined in um, lawsuits filed by, um, uh, what, what is Susan Greenhall's group called? Free uh, Speech for People um, has filed a couple of lawsuits it, one in North Carolina, I think the North Carolina NAACP joined in it, uh, challenging these new touchscreen systems, and one in Pennsylvania. Um, so, so that's good. And certainly, I've been speaking with the, the head of Black Voters Matter. Um, I believe she's in Tennessee, so she's been fo following some of my postings about the votes that disappeared from predominantly Black precincts in Tennessee. And there's a lot that the African American can, community can do um, in terms of monitor, you know, all the things that we're suggesting would be fantastic. Protectourvotes.com, we would love help with our poll tape project um, because we don't have access to these large lists of, of volunteers yet. And I would love for local or, or, or state NAACP groups to help with that. So I, I, I don't know, I think there is an awareness and it's just, we're all kind of, it's kind of, the organizing is really taking off. And I guess just the hope is that it's not too late, but we need all hands on deck um, and appreciate all the help we can get. You know, clear, clearly uh, the engagement of Black Lives Matter and the, and the communities that are gonna be most dramatically impacted by the kind of uh, terrorism or whatever you wanna call it at the polls, which is going to be, I think, engendered by the Trump people, you know, have to be understood and supported by all of us as much as possible. Uh, particularly in these in the uh, very vulnerable precincts of the swing states, the um, uh, Georgetown has run a number of these tabletop exercises, which have been broadly now publicized in Harper's and the New York Times and elsewhere, uh, which all demonstrate the vulnerabilities, you know, of a very narrow group of precincts. And most of those precincts, you know, are ones that are are uh, are embattled. Uh, so many many of them are heavily minority voters and uh, the NACP Legal Defense Fund is certainly engaged in that as are others. And it's all, they're gonna have to, we have to uh, make sure we understand that as we all work to develop this uh, citizen's firewall. All right, thank you. Alan, I would like to uh, bring in Sparky Landers for uh, the question. Um, and on the way in, I would just like to read Mark McDonald's question, put it on the table. How do we define and spread the basic standards of election integrity and security like we see in banking and finance? Okay. So please uh, bring in Sparky Landers. Great to see Jennifer and Jonathan because uh, we chat on Twitter quite a bit. We've had uh, some interesting conversations. The thing that I just wanted to bring to immediate attention is that I am highly concerned that 
people are still being told to contact by mail early and send their stuff back early by mail. And right now, the United States Postal Service is not to be trusted at all. Think about it. I mean, uh, for one thing, vote by mail envelopes are going to be pretty easy to spot. And with all the slowdown and everything else, they're going to be targeted. I just don't see how you can trust the Postal Service uh, until a, some kind of purge and investigation occurs. What do you think of that? Well, I would say even before the Postmaster General be, you know, was changed over to a um, Trump mega donor, not receiving mail ballots on time has always been a problem. And so before the lockdown and there were, before there was much concern even about coronavirus in the country, 17,000 voters in just Los Angeles County did not receive their mail ballots on time. During the pandemic, 30,000 of the 700,000 voters who requested mail ballots in New York City did not receive their mail ballots on time. Tens of thousands in Pennsylvania, 1 million in Maryland. Um, we need reliable, I, we cannot just put all our eggs in the vote by mail basket. Um, we need to have reliable in-person voting too. And that means we have to you know, tackle head on those, those wireless modems that they put in the swing states. And um, these electronic poll books, needing backup paper poll books. As far as getting the word out, the Medium article that I wrote got a lot more traction than I kind of expected it to. Um, and the Women for Biden has been circulating it and talked about making it into an animation so hopefully that'll help. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm worried about all aspects of our voting system. I, be it, I, I don't think just because you have a corrupt vote um, postmaster general though, that that necessarily means, that doesn't mean that the postal workers themselves are all corrupt, but certainly the higher ups can cause problems for the well-intended postal well, workers and delay Jennifer, the mail. What I'm saying, what I'm seeing is postal workers are telling their customers that in fact, he is doing things that are effectively making it nearly impossible for the uh, postal employees to get things delivered. I'm He's making them uh, sort things manually instead of using the machinery. He's doing all kinds of things that no matter how honest the postal workers are, the postal workers can't do what they normally do. So what I'm saying is overall, that mechanism, which I've always been concerned is a single point of failure, right now is very much a point of failure that we need to either change the fuse or we just need to make sure we bypass it. I don't know. That's why I do recommend delivering your ballot in person, using it sure. as little as possible, requesting it immediately. So if there's a delay, you have some time and then returning it in person if your county allows it. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much the formula, Sparky. I mean, I, I, I agreeing with Jennifer that requesting a mail-in ballot, if you do it far enough in advance, should kind of work. And you at least figure out if you haven't gotten the ballot by a certain point, uh-oh, you know, you, you then have to consider voting in person uh, or taking some sort of remedial action. But sending the ballot back by mail then becomes really problematic because ballots are identifiable by zip code, by address, and all sorts of ways. And we really, uh, it's a system that, that ha has been problematic all along and now uh, is actually being actively sabotaged uh, by Trump and his, and his mega donor, uh, Postmaster General. And uh, they've, just, they've just turned over a couple of his lieutenants as well. It's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's what Trump has done with basically oh. all of the departments. So I think, you know, what what we know is that we're 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 scurrying to find a safe route to cast ballots. We're also very troubled about the counting of ballots. We got a lot of lot of moles to whack. Um, but as far as the casting particularly goes, I mean, we know there are going to be lots of thumbs on the scale. Um, we know there's going to be efforts to legislative efforts, administrative efforts to block routes, uh, various ways uh, uh, of voting uh, to slow down the process. Signature matches are a big problem. We don't have a perfect solution. I mean, for anybody who can vote in person and who can vote in person with a hand marked ballot, 
that might be as as good as we can get. And of course, there are people who are more and less vulnerable as far as COVID goes. We've got to worry about poll workers. I mean, this is what's being exploited uh, right now. In the end, elections are a pure number game. So the really scary part here is that even if you have control or access to a relatively small slice of the pie, you can alter election results. I mean, you can have a lot of people doing the right thing, going to vote in person, using a ball pen and, and all of that. Uh, but you've got still a large number of people whose votes are going to be more vulnerable. They're going to use a BMD, a barcode BMD, which is, you know, basically has a RIGME post-it note sitting right on it. Uh, or they're going to mail in their ballots without having check their, the signature that's on file, for instance, and then there will be a signature mismatch and their ballot will disappear, uh, especially if it's from certain zip codes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where this idea, I think, you know, of a tsunami comes in because we know that there are gonna be thumbs and we know that there's gonna be counting issues. We know there's gonna be casting issues. In the 2018 election, midterm election, we saw an increase in turnout that was absolutely historical. Uh, we saw a 44% increase in turnout from the running 30-year average. It was unprecedented, nothing like that. We saw 118 million votes cast, and usually it's about 78 or 80. So there was a huge expansion of the electorate because people were waking up from their coma. I mean, the, the one thing that Donald Trump has done right is he's, he's gotten people more interested in voting. And if that follows through to the 2020 election and we get an equivalent um, expansion of voting from ordinary presidential years from 2016, that's gonna help in a big way. So the very, very simplest thing an individual voter can do is just say absolutely no to any thought of, well, I don't have to vote or I gotta go to work or I gotta this or I gotta that. I mean, granted, there are people who are really put to the test because they don't have childcare or they do have to go to work and their bosses will not let them off. This is one of those things that, that really calls for citizen heroism on every individual's part. Because if we get those 40 million extra votes, that's gonna go a long way to reducing the impact of all these various thumbs on the scale, whether they come against mail-in voting or they come against voting on ballot marking devices or any of these damn schemes. Uh, so we're gonna have to do as much as we can to make sure we can successfully cast our ballot. But the very first step in that is absolutely resolve to vote, period. And if you don't... God help us. Yeah, God well, help us. It's, and, yeah, it's, it's, we're going to have to make an effort, of course, to do anything we can do to help. I mean, I would almost consider renting a van for a day to go pick people up if I was allowed to do that. Uh, you and might, I may still might do not it, be, or, depending you on might not be allowed. Yeah. yeah, some places you find yourself in jail for doing I, that. I, I, did I, I realize that, that, and that's crazy too. Just real quick aside, because I know others want to get we, in here, is we, that Stacey actually, Abrams herself did not get her ballot in time and had to go vote in person. And she told that on, on TV. She said, this happened to me, that I was sabotaged. I'm the other thing on. about that I posted up is I did post up on the chat the uh, Twitter for Stacey Abrams fair fight. And yes, there are many people of color in the chain out there. And, uh, and I certainly uh, am one of the people, no matter what color I look like, very much want everybody to be able to vote no matter what. Yeah, me too. And as I, I, we're heading into our last minutes, I want to make sure that, that you, Jennifer Cohn, have a time to respond and a final word here, and that Senator Worth does too. And thank you very much, Sparky Landers, for, for uh, putting all of that on our table. Um, and so in moving into our final minutes here, I uh, also wanted to, to read uh, Susie Hart's uh, comment question here. Our March to the Ballot Box online webinar is a webinar going on today and this evening. 
Member orgs are Rainbow Push Coalition, NAACP, ACLU, and a dozen or more diverse groups are taking part in it. Tonight, there is a breakout group on election cybersecurity, one on legal battles to protect the vote, etc. Will you do a a program again with guests from those organizations, grow the, quote, all hands on deck citizens firewall coalition, as well as today's guests? I support that proposal and folks are uh, posting the link while we still have time.org in the chat. So I'd like to uh, turn to uh, Jennifer Cohn for a response and a final word and then to uh, Senator Worth. Sure. Sparky, yes, your comments reminded me of something that I meant to emphasize and forgot, which is um, we need to be in the room where it happens, by which I mean the room where the counting happens. Um, So when I talk about observers, I mean, in addition to a day to the extent we can get observers to observe the counting of absentee ballots, especially, um, and making sure that people are being called if their ballot is is rejected due to a signature mismatch. We need to do that. And I'm not entirely clear who is organizing it, but I imagine that the state and county political parties that organize observers for election day are organizing this as well, or can at least direct us in that direction. Um, It's so important. We need to watch and watch and report citizen reporting on anything problematic that is going on with the counting of absentee ballots. Thank you. Final note, Jeremy, we all have to be Paul Revere's in this to alert people to what's going on and uh, be part of this citizens firewall. Everybody has to vote. Uh, The Democrats, some Democrats are already whistling that this is going to be too big to rig. And they're wrong. You know, we have to make sure that uh, everybody works at it, understands where the holes are, where the problems can occur. Uh, Tell your friends and neighbors and your business partners and everybody else that uh, we all have to be at the highest state of alert, not only uh, between now and November 3rd, but probably in the month afterward. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. And Jonathan, any uh, quick uh, final comments? No, I, I think I, I put in my piece. I just I second that what Senator Worth just said and what Jenny just said. Uh, it we're it we, it's on us. We got to step up. Yep. All right. Well, I would just want to re- again really thank our our panelists, Jonathan Simon, Jennifer Cohn, and uh, Senator Timothy Worth for giving us their very crucial thoughts at this crucial moment in our history and uh, urging us towards uh, responsibility and action in our moment. And I want to thank for sure uh, Alan Rees at No Lies Radio for helping put all this together and producing it and tirelessly putting forth uh, crucial educational media content um, that is key to our moment. I just want to last say that there is a concerted effort to make this just the first of a series as we move into this crucial period here of another uh, event uh, in October to assess the situation then in the run-up to the election and then potentially a hopefully not a post-mortem but a uh, still living uh, body politic that is deeply in the mix but in this post-November context. And uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you so much to the audience uh, for participating and uh, giving us your attention and pondering these uh, difficult but crucial matters. And thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy.